Hi everyone. How are you guys doing today? Good. Are you alive? Or you're saying, oh my gosh. <laughs> now, got to listen to this guy at 4 o'clock. No? So the question is, how do we change the world we live in? I find that as I grow older, I'm more and more conscious of the fact that it's not sufficient to be just a consumer of things, of uh, artifacts that other people leave us. But do we have a core, play a role to play in changing the destiny? I think there's a Chinese proverb, maybe Larry can help me with this. May you live in interest, uh, interesting times. I think a related proverb might be, may you live in interesting spaces. And I think Stanford is certainly one of those spaces that I think produces the potential to change uh, life outcomes. I've been fortunate to interact with an uh, amazing variety of people, including Dr. Dasher. And I think Stanford brings together some of the best and the brightest who live to change the world. I'm going to take you through this particular company, uh, which I was fortunate to come across. And I, in, the, in the frame of how do you shape something, I volunteered to help the company uh, in its evolution. So today I'm going to talk about what have we done in the space of mass transportation. Uh, and I must tell you, the personal car, fascinating as it may be to many of us, is actually a public nuisance. In the pursuit of personal convenience, we have created a public menace. So look at the costs of owning a car. Uh, we have certainly the internal fixed costs of uh, purchasing a car, and we have the internal variable costs of uh, driving it. But we have additional external fixed costs. And this particular graph shows you the external costs, uh, sometimes called externalities, that are imposed on the system. These include uh, parking, road facilities, land use, congestion, pollution, greenhouse gases, water, services, et cetera. Now, we don't directly pay for most of this, but what happens is we want to commute, we take our car out, and before you know it, we are sitting in a giant parking lot called 101. <laughs> now, how does the personal car compare with other modes of transport? So you're here you've got the automobile, a smaller car, an electric car, and you see not much changes. Nor does it change um, particularly with respect to a small truck. I'll come to the right share later. But you look at a bus, electric trolley, et cetera, all of these have costs of different magnitudes and not particularly different than an average automobile, except, of course, if you are walking or biking, in which case mostly there are variable costs associated with your own effort and time. But you take a look at the ride-share passenger, which is optimal in terms of externalities and uh, initial fixed costs. It's mostly a variable cost. And by this, we mean essentially sharing a vehicle so that it is optimized. So based on existing technology, you can see that this is true. But now, let's talk about what does a personal car do on the road? It turns out to be a phenomenal space hog. There is something called shy distance between one vehicle and the other. And this is the amount of space you need to maintain so that you don't bang into the vehicle in front. And so think about it. A vehicle of about 15 feet requires like 200 feet of distance at 60 some miles an hour to make sure it doesn't crash into the vehicle in front of it. When it does that, it occupies a lot more of the space on a road than, let's say, a bigger vehicle, which carries more passengers. So, this particular artifact takes infrastructure, like a highway, and converts it into uh, essentially far less efficient system for transporting people and goods. The net result of this is we have congested our cities in an extraordinary way. If someone from outer space could take a look at what we are doing every day, they would say these humans have gone mad. Every day they rush out in the morning at 8 o'clock, and then they creep along some long passage, and then they repeat the same thing in the evening. Right. Every city, and these are all this, this US cities, and uh, there are two indices here. One is the travel time index, which is the 
amount of time over your regular, if uh, uncongested driving time, and the other is the amount of delays uh, per commuter. Now, the funny thing is, advanced countries rush into these kinds of systems, whether it is building freeway infrastructure or metros, et cetera, and developing countries creep into that over a period of time as an aspect of development. Yet, the lessons that the advanced countries are learning are often lost on the developed countries in their pace for industrialization. Many of these things, so I go to India often, we are building metro systems. The first metro systems were built in something like 1865. So India is building metro systems some 150 years later, yet the problems of metro systems are well known. Relatively dedicated infrastructure, servicing uh, a particular lane in terms of tra transit, extraordinarily high costs. The Indian uh, metro system, one of them is, has taken 20 years and still not operational, right? And of course, some countries are doing it faster, but the metro is no solution because it doesn't solve the first and last mile problem. So you're forcing people to come to a station to enter the train, then they'll exit somewhere else and either have to walk or find other transport back to their, uh, to their uh, workplace, and then they repeat the pattern. Now, people say, oh, well, let's just increase the amount of infrastructure then. If there are so many cars, let's have more lanes, more exits. But what Littman shows in a study that as you increase infrastructure, the generated traffic increases proportionately. And so you have the same congestion. And in the last 10 years, we have seen this in the Bay Area. We said, oh yeah, Bay Area, you know, we are building more lanes on 101. It's going to be wonderful. And we pass all these cesses and uh, you know, additional taxes, et cetera. And before you know it, we are still on the same parking lot. So the price of not doing it right is this. Everywhere in the world, developed or undeveloped countries, right? So I, in Bangalore now, the Silicon Valley of India, it's become the norm for people to say, don't have more than one meeting a day, right? Because you cannot return from that meeting. There are cases where people fly into Bangalore airport, and lo and behold, and it's a one-day trip, intending to leave the same day, and they cannot get to their meeting, and they return, right? It can take three hours sometimes. So this congestion is become so normative, we expect delays. We, we think of it as, let's plan our life to be waiting in a parking lot, creeping along. It's a very sad story. So the question is, what do we do? We just have to think differently. Now, these cost huge problems. If idling cars sitting around, billions of dollars. You have other, if it is a stationary situation, then we have this other problem of unused uh, uh, equipment during non-peak hours. So you see all these buses, bar trains, metros, they have to run the full infrastructure even though there's no one traveling because they are built for peak. So you've got this, all this wastage. You've got this human wastage. Just imagine, what would you say is your productive day on average? How many hours? How many hours is your productive day in general? Six, Six hours. hours. Okay. Uh, any other guesses? How many, out of 24 hours, how many, uh, what is the human productivity? Eight hours. Eight hours. Now let's say you're working, let's say you're working in San Francisco but living here. What is your commute time? Say two hours? Right, an hour up, an hour down. So out of an eight hour working day, you have just dropped your efficiency by 25%, right? It's just incredible the amount of human wastage. We talk about we have to improve productivity, we're going to train them, we're going to give, give them management techniques, we're going to put them in these open space tables, everything will be magical, human productivity will increase. Human productivity, if it could be improved by transit, we would have solved a huge problem. So here we are, introducing the future. Next is a computer, uh, sorry, next is a computer, it's also true, it was a computer. Uh, next is a company born in Italy. So the founder of this company is an Italian gentleman, and sometimes I tell people he is the blend of Michelangelo with Elon Musk. 
He has got an artistic capability that is mind boggling. At the same time, an engineering proficiency which, which calls to mind the kinds of things that uh, Tesla is doing. It's an advanced, scalable mass transit system. And these are basically made of pods which are intended to pick up and drop off people. These pods have the ability to connect to each other. And when they connect to each other, they have the ability to open the doors in between so that you can walk between the pods. So what happens then? You can go from one pod to the other, and the pods then separate. Let me see if I can click this and make something come to life. So how many of you are Uberized in the sense that you take Uber as a way of moving about? Maybe 10 of you. I would just pick. Jump. Okay. So what has Uber done for us? It has said, don't take out your car. Instead, let me have a polite gentleman or lady come and pick you up in a very nice vehicle, and you just tell us your destination and we'll drop you off. It's amazing invention or innovation using existing technologies, right? Apart from the orchestration of uh, demand and supply. What we are doing, if you will, is the next stage where we're talking about mass customized transit. So now let's just take the Uber problem, which is person A wants to go from, you know, X to why? But if you have persons A, B, C, D wanting to go to destinations X, Y, Z, how do you accommodate that problem? Right. Now, in an Uber situation, it may be multiple cars. And of course, Uber has come up with uh, ride share, et cetera, but doesn't always get us that optimality. So we talked about multiple types of optimality. One is the optimality associated with human time utilization. We talked about optimality associated with freeway infrastructure. We talked about optimality of running uh, you know, the right kinds of costs, because costs finally get back to us, whether it's metros or cars on the freeway or additional roads. So when you're talking about different kinds of optimality, how do you solve for optimality in mass transit? So that's the problem we are trying to solve. So as you can see in this pod, let's say you got onto this pod, and these are, let's say this is four or six pods uh, long, you are, based on your destination that you have dialed up in your app, it says move to pod number three, that is going to Saratoga. Pod number two, who's the neighbor that you sat with, who was picked up in the same vehicle, might be going to San Jose. So he's invited to go to pod number one, because that is going to San Jose. Now, all of you are picked up at home, and you're going to be individually dropped off in your place of work. And the pattern repeats itself. All right, so how does it uh, contrast with, let's say, a bus? It'll be cheaper than a bus because we'll be, uh, uh, oh, let's, uh, so how would we uh, look at a business model? Then I'll come to uh, prices and costs. 
So initially we are thinking that we will replace existing fleets which are servicing uh, local neighborhoods, campuses, et cetera, like the Marguerite. And let me see if there's an animation which plays here. Says media not found. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyhow, no worries. So, anyhow, so what uh, one can, uh, what this is illustrating is, initially, what we would do is to have these modules replace these fleets, and we would start assembly of these modules. So, what we are creating is a scalable bus, right? We are saying the simplest version is one module which is like you know ten feet uh, long, uh, you know normal width, so it can operates on existing roads in your neighborhood. Then it starts assembling itself into a bus. So you know, it can be four um, uh, modules long. It can be 10 modules long. And each one of these modules essentially consists of four wheels, electric, uh, each, each wheel independently steered. And then it starts connecting itself. Now the last slide here, the last uh, part of the slide here, is showcasing something that we call on-demand services. And we are reconceptualizing uh, what it means to, to actually be in transit. So as Tommaso indicated in his slide, um, our founder, the concept is life in motion. So the question is, what do you do when you're in transit? Now, what we do normally is to grip the steering wheel and listen to the radio and curse the guy in front of us, right? But what if you could be relaxed, you could be entertained, you could call for a Starbucks module to come and attach to you so that you can have your cappuccino. You could have a business meeting by having a Regis module connect to you and you have an office that is in the next module. What if a cinema can attach to you, AMC has a module which comes and shows you the latest movie, right? What if we could have a battery module which comes and replaces batteries so that you never, don't have to stop and you can go from coast to coast? So we are imagining these modules, which are specialized modules which can do a variety of functions. So in that sense, we say transit need not be a waste of time. Transit is something that you do while you are doing something more important. Now in terms of comparison, of course we are seeing certainly in the valley the self-driving car. There are these modular pods, which are single-person vehicles. And then there's a self-driving bus. We are already seeing through auto and other uh, initiatives the notion of a self-driving truck and self-driving buses are coming. The, the key thing is how much occupancy can you get? Uh, model, modular pod, you can get 100% because it's one person occupying one seat. Self-driving cars, maybe there are a couple of people. Uh, Self-driving buses, because of uh, peak and uh, non-peak issues, is inevitably slower. We believe we can get a much higher occupancy rate. Our traffic footprint is obviously fairly small compared to uh, in a most uh, entities. Um, and our total cost per passenger kilometer, and we have estimated at 0 0.08, uh, there is some factoring of the fact that electric batteries will get cheaper and it's easier to charge, et cetera, et cetera. But fundamentally, uh, and the pod that we have can seat today six passengers, maybe 10 standing. And if we pay, uh, fit uh, like a normal bus, about 50 passengers, uh, we occupy about 53 feet with eight modules. And versus 10 cars will now have a distance of about 60 meters. So that's the difference between a, and a solution which is dynamically assembled to carry multiple passengers versus a, a rigid system or a, an inefficient one. Junior, can I interrupt you for a second? Go back to the previous slide. The, po the modular pod you're talking about there would be an individual in one pod, no, one no. person per pod. What's the difference between next and the modular pods? So the modular pods are essentially single person, almost like an airline seat moving, yeah, right? Okay. Okay. Whereas ours uh, currently is designed for six passenger okay. seated. Okay. And I'll show you a picture of our full scale one. Okay. So what happens during a rush hour, right? We are traffic efficient as a bus, as efficient as a bus, fully loaded bus, and therefore we have 100% load factor, and uh, we are occupying minimal space, et cetera. And therefore, next guarantees 80% less traffic congestion 
and 31% lower fuel consumption. So at peak traffic, we are actually very efficient. Now what happens at uh, medium traffic issues? We are ubiquitous and fuel efficient as a shared taxi during low and medium traffic. So next guarantees greater occupancy, more frequency, and uh, lower fuel consumption in that uh, phase as well. Because we are optimizing the, uh, the number of modules that connect and the number of people per module. And then you look at low traffic, we are probably the best because much like uh, a solution of uh, individual needs as required, we operate the modules. In fact, we, while we are still in our development stages, we are quite surprised. We got a mail one day from a mayor of a town in Germany. He said, I would like to order your more pods right now. Now, we have not yet built a working full-scale model, but he wants 50 of these pods. Why? He says, I'm a small town. I'm operating some 50 buses. And, I've, and the reason I have all these buses and the drivers is because I need to have uh, service during festivals that I operate. And if I don't have that, then I cannot meet the requirement of visitors coming into my town. Yet, during all the times that there is no festival, I'm just idling the buses and I'm idling the workers. right? And they have to be maintained, et cetera, et cetera. I would love to have your pods. Right? So we said, look at wait, much like what Elon Musk is telling us, got to wait. So we did a simulation of what it might be from here to San Francisco. Let's say, you know, going for Mountain View, you, this is your next app, and uh, you t decide, tell, us, tell it where to go, and uh, it picks you up, and it picks up others. And now it starts assembling itself en route, and there will be different uh, uh, numbers of these going along the route uh, as it forms the, the, the bus train, as we call it. And then gradually it frees up other modules. You know, some might head off it, uh, on Dumbarton Bridge, some might head off to uh, uh, on 92. Uh, if the regulators allowed, allow it, we might go on the HOV lane. But in any case, we eventually end up in the city and then distribute the pods to the location that you want. I remember as a young kid, uh, I had been used to traveling on trains which did not have the ability to go from one coach to the other. I don't know. I wonder how many people in this room have experienced that. Anyone? Where the coaches don't uh, allow you to transit. So you got into one coach uh, at the railway station, but you cannot get to the next one until the train stops at a station. Anyone experienced that? Yeah? Well, it was very common in India uh, until we suddenly got these coaches that had the vestibular connection. And suddenly, it was magical, right? You could walk the length of the train, and you could go to the restaurant car, and so on, right? And uh, since we have time, I remember that in, in that journey, uh, the way in which you got meals was uh, Everything used to be loaded onto one coach, and the people used to transfer their meal trays from the outside while the train was in motion, almost like acrobats, uh, because there was no other way to get to the coach and serve the meal. In any case, what we are doing is something similar. We are saying, what if we could give you the ability to go from one coach to the other while in transit? Now, the business scenario of this is, we initially intend to sell into the public transportation agencies and the operators uh, that serve that scenario. And users would then consume that app, uh, identify their solution set, and off they go. But there are other variations, right, uh, which, is a, which is this scenario. But there are other possibilities. So what if we said there's a consumer version of this, and you don't need to buy your car, but you buy a next module and you park it in your uh, driveway. And when you want to use it, you climb on it and move on. And if not, you allow it to be summoned, and it goes and services other people. So this is the social pooling sharing scenario. Uh, and I think 
Tesla also has something like that in mind, potentially with this or a new feature that he released yesterday. Then you've got this augmented use scenario that I talked about, which is specialization, which allows you to convert, which allows businesses to say that earlier, and, uh, and I want to contrast this with uh, e-commerce. So what did e-commerce change? So before we had a system where you would go to a store, you would go to Walmart, Target, et cetera, buy things. And then Amazon came and said, amongst others, you don't need to do that. You just go to the web, you order, and the object comes to you. So now play that same scenario out for other services. Today we go to a hotel and check in. We go to a Starbucks and drink their coffee. And we go to a Regis office space and rent their conference room. But what if all of that could come to you? So that's the scenario we are talking about here, where there, these businesses would reinvent themselves by saying, we are Hilton. We have 5,000 hotels on the move. These hotels can come to you. right? And these Starbucks modules can come and attach to you and deliver beverages when you want, and so on. So our first market strategy is to replace public transportation inefficient fleet. Now, there's a logical construct to this. All fleets need uh, replacement, upgrades, whatever. And so we want to be in the, in the throes of that. And here's an example for, for example, Singapore. So 4,000 some buses is the fleet size of Singapore. And let's say we take eight modules to replace one bus. So now you've got the potential to have, uh, and, and we, we are anticipating a conversion, fleet conversion rate of you know, 10 to 60%. Depending on that, you can see that we have a substantial line of business that we could do just in Singapore uh, with fairly substantive margins. Now, this is not to minimize the effort involved in bringing something like this to market. So our first, uh, we are not a vehicle manufacturer, although we have built uh, multiple prototypes, small and big, uh, including full scale. So initially, we would go to uh, manufacturers who are professionals at building prototypes. And we have quotations from many of these. And they are eager to build us one or many. But these are people who essentially manufacture the first units. So these units can cost up to a million bucks, the first unit. right? Our expected price at, uh, as it drops rapidly, and you can see the simplicity of our design. We basically are a shell with a chassis, four wheels, uh, independently driven, electric motors attached, and software. So the amount of effort involved in building one of these is not significant, and we expect uh, and of course, a bunch of sensors all around the vehicle. We expect the price of this to drop fairly rapidly under volume. And eventually, we feel that these can be uh, assembled as a kit. So hopefully, we can drop it into Africa, and people assemble it in a few hours, and they have a next module that is connected to the uh, global positioning system and uh, is off and running. So in that sense, we expect prices to drop fairly rapidly, and we uh, anticipate that this could be in the range of you know, under $100,000 in a relatively short period of time. Now, uh, I was talking to Larry earlier uh, as we were waiting for the, uh, this meeting to start. The question is, where do these kinds of solutions fit? Would they fit in a developed country like the US? Uh, Germany, France, et cetera, where there's an extensive, fairly large economy, fairly extensive uh, public transport system, therefore the ability to afford all, those, all of these things. And the answer is, uh, yeah, the money is there, the market may be there, but the inclination to allow solutions like this is relatively low. So we are participating in smart city initiatives in the US and other places, and we find while there is interest, the momentum to actually get to a working road solution is not as high. Now, cars, autonomous cars are coming in suddenly, uh, and, and we will uh, use that 
we'll platoon into that effect and hopefully uh, be advantaged. But there is going to be a time before all of that happens. The second set of possibilities are cities that are being uh, constructed in India and China, et cetera, where a ton of money is going into new infrastructure. Would that be the place to go and find our market? And the reality of those, city, of those cities and countries is, uh, while you might not be challenged with existing infrastructure, you're challenged with ways of doing business and the fact that you're trying to introduce something new and novel in a place that might not necessarily allow it. The third possibility, the things that we are to toying with right now, are places where there is money, the inclination, and the appetite to digest uh, innovation. One such place turns out to be Dubai. Uh, this is His Majesty, uh, the ruler of Dubai, uh, Sheikh Mahmoud Al Maktoum, and he has got a vision. By 2030, he wants 25% of all traffic in Dubai to be autonomous. Now, he has just picked it up you know, from somewhere, and he says, this is a vision I, the ruler, have. Okay? So now he has instructed his ministries, and he's got visions in various things, the amount of uh, CO2 to be emitted in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. And when he tweeted this, he used our picture. We, didn't, we, have no presence at, we had no presence in Dubai at that time. But it is illustrative of the fact that there are people who have impact, who see this as a viable solution. Through eight ministries, he's now said, I want you guys, uh, the heads of these ministries, to impact how this vision is going to be achieved. Based on that, they started something called the Dubai Future Foundation, which has vested about a billion dollars of some money. And the Dubai Future Foundation then launched something called the Dubai uh, Future Accelerators. Uh, this, they invited companies from around the world to uh, bid for a slot uh, in their accelerator program. Uh, we were lucky to be chosen. We were one of 30-some companies chosen out of 2,000 and so companies. And we were in the road and transport agency segment. So there are three companies in that segment. Uh, one is uh, Hyperloop, the second is ours, and the third one is uh, a company called Movement. So we are working actively. We are present in Dubai. Our t uh, my team is in Dubai right now. And we are working with the agency there to figure out how to bring the solution to life. And I must tell you that it has been an uh, exhilarating experience. Uh, the people are motivated. Uh, they want to get this uh, solution out. Dubai is hosting uh, Expo 2020. Uh, as, and this, these expos happen once every five years. And what we have proposed is that we be one of the solution providers for Expo 2020 to illustrate that you can order a mobile unit to come and pick you up and that mass transit of this time uh, can, be happen, can happen. So that happened, and this was, uh, do, 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 do. I forget what date, no. uh, uh, let's say a couple months, uh, three months back or so. This is much more recent, so this is 3rd of October. Uh, we are now in Dubai, that's Emmanuel A, or my colleague and CEO of the company. This is His Highness uh, Sheikh Maktoum. And here we are demonstrating uh, uh, two units coupled in motion. So we have written the software for these units to couple and decouple. And uh, we showed a small track. They actually come by. Uh, I forgot to bring the video associated with that. But um, if any of you are interested, we can certainly send, send you that. But so now we have written, demonstrated the ability for something like this to occur. That uh, independent modules can sense each other. When there is proximity, it then goes and aligns itself in a track. It senses the roadway through cameras, and then it uh, you know, couples and decouples. We also put together a uh, full-scale prototype. Uh, we built two prototypes, and we uh, exhibited this at InnoTrans in uh, Berlin. And then because Dubai insisted on having these prototypes, uh, we had signed up a relationship, a strategic relationship with Kareem. That the name, yeah. Kareem is the Uber of the Middle East, uh, fairly significant player. And 
what we have done is to say, let us uh, bring this solution forward together. So Dubai's Kareem says to launch driverless port tests within a year. So this was uh, in the college times a uh, couple of days back. So we are all over the news in Dubai in terms of bringing this to life uh, as a relatively uh, viable proposition. We are actually, we, I tell my colleagues, we have too much press. Uh, we are very, very visible, very public. Uh, you know, we are written up about all the time. And uh, personally, I'd rather have less publicity uh, at this age of, uh, of, of our evolution. It's like praising a kid that he's going to be Einstein before the kid has gone to school. So, but that's where we are. Uh, I guess we should consider ourselves fortunate, uh, but we are fairly uh, visible. That's my story, and I am sticking to it. <laughs> so uh, there are all kinds of directions to go for questions on this. What's the hardest technology part to this? Uh, and you're saying the hardest technology part. Because not the, there, there are various things. There's yeah. the autonomous vehicle. Right. There's the routing technology that's software, right? The uh, hardest technology piece of this is going to be, uh, for us, when we are putting these pods together, now you've got a multiplicity. Each pod has got four independently steerable wheels. As you put these together, we are still operating every module's wheels, right? So the module is still in transit. So now imagine that I have to come around a curb or I have to overtake another car, et cetera. The complexity of steering every wheel at speed optimally is a non-trivial problem, right? Now, trains do this easily because they are going on a track. Cars and buses do it because they have rigid uh, axles and you know, the steering is on one, uh, one axle or the other. Here we are doing simultaneous steering. So with that complexity comes opportunity. This vehicle can, can literally spin on its wheels, right? So we, all we have to do is change the turning radius of each one of these uh, units. Uh, Non-trivial complexity, we solved a piece of it. We are showing it at slow speed for two modules. But I can imagine when it is four modules and eight modules, it's a non-trivial problem. What kind of a timetable do you have? Are you going to be in Dubai for this 2020 Expo? So the accelerated program ends mid-December. But what uh, we are discussing with the Road and Transport Authority is uh, uh, a phased approach to delivering real solutions by 2020. And we'll see whether it happens. I, I mean, as, uh, to us, it was serendipitous that we got chosen. And, but we have to see whether the evolution remains stable as, predict, as predicted. There is enormous interest. Uh, we are certainly the, uh, it, it's like an Arabian night story. We are situated, along with all these other companies, in the Emirates Towers, which is where the prime minister's office is. And this gentleman, you know, I, I didn't know much about him earlier. Quite remarkable. He just walks about. And it's not unknown for him to be in the coffee shop at Starbucks in that, uh, in that uh, entity, which also hosts uh, a very public mall, to be having coffee and paying for it. So he's that kind of a guy. Uh, so apparently, that vision then prevails that other people are motivated to act in the best interest of Dubai. So we'll see. I mean, it's uh, to us also, it's an experiment. But so far, we are very. You know, uh, impressed by how it's being run. So one of the things that interested me about this from the very beginning, a few years ago, I heard Scott McNeely, the former CEO of Sun Microsystems, say that Uber is interesting, autonomous cars are interesting, autonomous Uber is a lot more interesting. And then just recently, there is a kind of shared version of Uber called Chariot that started up in the Bay Area where people really are sharing rides uh, and cutting the cost down by doing this. And this is one generation beyond that. It combines both of those. Yeah. Um, but there's an awful lot of kind of uncertainty with regard to human behavior. The human behavior outside this vehicle. Right. Yeah. Outside the vehicle and also what people will pay for. 
Right. So, uh, if you factor in uh, time efficiency and what they and this is what I understand, for instance, uh, from my Google friends, they might be top executives. They might have a Tesla, a Tesla in their driveway. Many of them actually take the Google bus because it changes what you can do with your time. Yeah. So in that sense, I, uh, I believe that there is, there's going to be a lot of pickup, even the same reason that Chariot is now getting more popular. And the fact that uh, at a minimum, you get uh, an advantage of personal use of time. We, apart from early adoption issues uh, of, you know, is this safe? Is it going to do what, I'm, uh, what I think it might do? I think we'll adopt it uh, if it is available. I remember the resistance to Uber initially and, uh, and similar uh, things like Ola in India. I don't know this driver. Is he certified? You know, where, will it be safe? True. Then there are some hurdles to be crossed and you know, certain kinds of uh, new kinds of systems, cameras, alarming systems, et cetera, to be put in place. But once you do, now most people get off a plane and as, as the plane, uh, you know, as they reach the baggage area, they say, get me a Uber. The Uber is there and off they go. And you think, look at other people waiting in taxi line and saying, didn't they get the memo from the office saying right. use Uber? Right, so things change. Yeah, uh, that's very true. How much can you tell us about the state of the company in terms of funding and in terms of number of employees right now? Uh, what kind of a you know projection do you have about how much it's going to cost to really get this off the ground? So we are very early stage. Uh, we are uh, about you know, 15 people total. Uh, we are self-funded at the present time. We are looking for money. Um, so uh, when you look for money, as well, many of you know, you look for the right kind of money. It's not just the money that you need right now, but the money leads to other money that can eventually stage you know, uh, things like new kinds of customers and uh, 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 interesting exits, et cetera. So, we are in that early, we have not yet done a Series A, so we are uh, looking for money right now. At the same time, what you do with these kinds of things is you never take money too early and you don't take too much money at the wrong time. You don't give up too much control. At the same time, you want certain kinds of strategic relationships. So. Just as, a, uh, as Richard mentioned uh, earlier, uh, uh, I had written a book a long time back. And in that book, I talked about there are three C's that you have to watch when you're running a company. Right? The first C is uh, controls. When you, uh, I'm sorry, the first C is choices. What choice do you make? So for instance, as, a, as, uh, as uh, next, let us say we were approached by GM and we were approached by Mercedes, right? And they say, we, would, we love your technology, we would love to be uh, part of the, what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. Let me give you some money, right? Let, I, let me give you a million bucks. Should we take that money? Let's say we are starving, we don't have money. I have an offer, two offers, one from Mercedes, one from GM. What should I do? Thoughts? Make them fight for your. Let's say they fight. Yeah, let's say GM fight says. For your company. Yeah, yeah. Let's say they fight, and they say, GM says, "I'll give you two million. Mercedes is giving only one. I'll give you two. What should I do?" Then you make a term which is favorable to you. Okay. How do I decide that? Depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. Depends on what you have in your hand. Depends on what the customer wants. You have to identify it first. So let us say I take. All that is beautiful, okay? So I love the story. GM says, you know what? I'm going to make you very happy. You know, you're all GM employees. You know, I'm, I'm going to uh, you know, acquire you for 10 million. Tell him no. Well, I want to build a product for you so that you can have money. Yeah, that who can have money? GM? GM have money. They so this is what money. happens, right? <laughs> uh, when you play with these large companies, you cannot control your evolution. So what happens is, many companies, this is a Richard can tell you, they cancel the project. Now what are you going to do? You were, you were last year's interesting baby, to this year you're not interesting anymore. And suddenly you're stuck. 
So the first C is choices. How do you make choices for a company? The second C is controls. So given a choice, the controls that you have suddenly change. Right? So the VC looks at you and says, oh, you took funding from GM. That's very interesting because you have just written off every other bus manufacturer in the world. They say, oh, I did that? I just wanted money. No, you made a choice. And with that choice, you gave up control. It's not necessarily a bad choice, but the, your destiny just changed. So choices, controls, and then you have to live with the consequences. Your path is now defined by the control that you exercise from the choices that you made. Anyhow, that's the uh, dimensionality of funding that we are looking at. For instance, uh, here, for instance, we are in Dubai. We have interest from players there who have a lot of money. We are having many interesting conversations. But we will come upon a time when we say, do we make this choice or not? And we'll have to see. I'll come to you for advice. So one of the things that I noticed about what you said is that really you've been looking. So you get, you get contacted by the mayor of a German town. And you're in Dubai doing these experiments in Dubai now. You're aware of the situation in India very well. What would you like to see in terms of global expansion? What kind of a pattern do you think would make the most sense? And that's not necessarily what the company's going to do, OK? I'm going to remove that so that you're not speaking for the company. I think as humans, we are not solving macroeconomic issues. This is showing up in many different dimensions. You look at pollution. We are literally ruining our planet because we say, I have a right to pollute. Right? And there's no consequence to that. In India, as many of you, uh, some of you might have gone, it is dirty like, you know, crazy. You know, it's really filthy. Why? Because we take no responsibility. We say, it's OK. You know, just toss the trash. Right? Similarly, in our, what we uh, think is advanced technology behavior, we take, we, I bought the latest BMW. You know, it's got this and that. The reality is it's one person driving a $100,000 machine, which is extra extraordinarily inefficient in terms of a macroeconomic behavior. right? But we sustain that behavior, and we do not engage with each other on how to find optimality. And finally, the consequence is this network effect works out where everyone is solving for personal optimality and ends up that no one is optimal, because we are all sitting in this macro par parking lot. What I'd like to see is things that, rather than being punitive, like, like London has imposed on, if you enter London between this time and that time, you have surcharges which are very high. Now, instead of that, what you have is a system which says, why would you want to drive your car into London downtown? We have a better system. And that comes from saying, we have these kinds of solutions. We got uh, ways to get you there. Uh, you know, whether it's Uber, Rideshare, or other ways, which give people the options of c commuting in with delight and convenience so that they are not seeking their personal optimal solutions. Right. So okay. Singapore is a case in point. I think they have solved relatively well compared to many other large cities. It is safe, great mass transit. You know, you can get around town very easily. But if you try to bring a car into Singapore, your penalty is like 5x or some huge number. You know, a small car in Singapore, like a Toyota Camry, might cost you well over 100,000 bucks. And it's not easy to get that license to import. Now, and that is a punitive way of doing it. I don't think we should be there. But there must be, uh, if we are intelligent human beings, there has got to be a more optimal way of doing this. Yeah. Uh, it is interesting that Singapore is where the, one of the first autonomous Uber-type uh, companies is located, right? In autonomy. Yeah. So that, that's already under trial, I under think. Trial, yes. So uh, and they have money, they have a need, right? Yeah. You have choices. We have, well, we hope, we hope to hear from the mayor of Singapore. Let's open the floor. Any um, questions or comments from the audience? Go ahead. Yeah, my question is regards safety. Uh, in the United States, if you're on a bus, like a Greyhound bus, you don't have airbags, you don't need seatbelts, but if a car hits a bus, you're not going to get hurt. If you're in a car or a van or something, you have to have airbags, seatbelts, and a couple of those. 
it, uh, what is your com company's position on providing the same safety if a you're an autonom your autonomous car is going to be smart enough not to hit anything else? But if somebody hits you, you have no control of it. The answer is simple. It's not rocket science. If the regulatory requirement is to solve for seat belts and solve for, solve for airbags, we will if we are operating that environment. That is not a technology hurdle. It's only a pricing issue. And if the market will bear the price, so be it. So I could see several variations. One of the things in the video is your, your app, the app on your smartphone tells you that you need to move to another module. It may be that that could only happen while the, the train is stopped. Could be. Right, that it would pull over to the side and let people switch modules at some point. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in most countries, uh, I don't know that, I, I think in the U.S. they say, please do not stand up and move in the bus while it's in motion, right? I don't know whether it's a regula uh, it's a operator discretion or it is a regulator or regulatory requirement. Most buses don't have airbags and do not have seat belts. So that is the operational mechanism here. If you go to India or many other places, oh, people will be walking up and down doing all kinds of things. So the regulatory environment is different. And the speeds are, of course, much slower. Right? So I, I believe we can meet those kinds of requirements easily. Uh, our, the center of gravity of, of our vehicle is extremely low. The battery is at, uh, uh, below the chassis. And if you couple the weight of the chassis and the, the, the weight of the batteries, this vehicle is not easy to overturn. Right? So yes, there can be damage due to head-on collisions and all that. But this is true of any operating vehicle. I would have to follow up on your point and say that this is a great example of kind of our version of innovation where you develop a new technology and you figure that the regulatory situation will catch up with it eventually. Uber is a great example of that. No one knew how that should be regulated. Is it really a public transportation company or is it a sharing company? No one knew what to do with that. The liability issues had not been worked out. And a lot of places in Asia have been very hesitant to make any kind of technology innovation until the government regulation specifically says, you can do this, or we would like to support ideas in this space. So that you're actually running ahead of that. And I do think that's kind of a, an approach that we have on this side of the Pacific, more than in most of the Asia economies. But we are seeing an inter in, intermediate state where for limited environments. Uh, so let us say um, people, Fox can't run big factories. People have to move from their accommodation to the factory. One could argue that that kind of transit system can be easily regulated. It's an internal environment. Yeah. You put a dedicated lane, you put sensors, and you say, okay, this is the way in which traffic moves up and down, right? So I, I believe that there are systems you know, places where we can innovate like that to get people mm -hmm. comfortable and refine the technology. Okay. Other uh, questions or comments? How many of you would want to ride in something like this? Yeah? You find it interesting enough? Yeah? Where should we, what, would love to hear your thoughts. You're all smart people. Uh, Stanford, Bay Area, Silicon Valley, Global. What should we do? Advise me. Back in the back. Go ahead. So I guess this is a little bit like Uber in the sense of, you know, you can also send me a request and then it goes and picks it up, right? Say that again? It's a little bit like Uber. Because right, it comes and picks you up yeah. where you want to be picked so, up. So, so in that case, like, you know, in Uber when demand increases, there's like surge rate, right? Are you also going to have surge rate? So we are not operators, right? We are technology providers. <coughs> so the operator will decide these kinds of things. We hope that Uber will be a customer of this, and they can decide. I have to say that in the United States, one of the very first places where I really see a business in this, between uh, Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Yeah, that's a great I mean, idea. That would be, you know, you pick people up from all over Las, Los Angeles, and the bus assembles and there's booze in the bus. Now I focused uh, my talk mostly on people movement, but the more likely evolution is actually cargo movement. Uh -huh. And we are going to see a lot of that happening. So think of it. Uh, once again, viewed from space, we are 
a mega organism consuming food every day and mm, dispersing garbage, right? Food has to come in every day and has to you know, be taken out as junk. That process today is done by truckers. Right? There are about 1.5 million truckers in the US moving uh, stuff uh, through the various, you know, from factories to distribution points to retail stores, et cetera. That system is going to change due to autonomous driving. There are already autonomous trucks in the system, and we plan to impact that as well. So imagine uh, for a minute, uh, I'll just take Dubai as an example. Dubai grows practically nothing, right? Uh, everything has flown in. So we could have a system which says, go to the cargo plane, suck out fresh lettuce, strawberries, what have you, that uh, needs to supply uh, uh, the city. Attach yourself to the local grocery store, distribute the uh, you know, goods. In the evening, some other system of this picks up the garbage and puts it in the, uh, in the city dump. Do you see that as a viable path for us? What do you guys think? Should we go people or should we go cargo? Choices. It's a comment. I don't know which government official nor agency made this comment, but it was the Highway Safety Department, something to that effect, and they were citing the traffic deaths, I think, in 2015. And what caught me most was the statement made that they expected there to be zero traffic fatalities in the next, I think, 20 to 30 years, which to me was code for autonomous vehicles. Otherwise, what justification would they possibly have? to make that sort of comment. That's right. In fact, yeah. Yeah. The most dangerous uh, entity on the road is the human driver. Right? Drunk, inattentive, what have you. I read, I read an article, too, of a truck, I think it must have been a trucking firm that was trying to justify the use of autom autonomous trucks based upon, I think, the difficulty in procuring labor. Mm -hmm. And they were justifying. The but at the same time, as I said, there are 1.5 million uh, truck drivers who are going to be put out of work because of technologies like this. And, and uh, we, we are entering a world of disruption. And we are going to redefine you know, what does it mean to have a job. American Trucking Associates says 3.5. Oh, there you go. OK. <laughs> what so about that? the freight, immediately I can see somebody like FedEx. Because they have a combination of very large vehicles, and also they have to have very much smaller vehicles to deliver into neighborhoods. That's right. If you had a robotic kind of system inside the vehicle to move the packages around. So we have done that. We have done yeah. a design of this, which is a UPS slash FedEx version of it, which is it's loaded in the UPS center. Then as it comes towards your home, it moves the parcel to the right window, which opens only for you when you punch a security code. Which actually suggests that some place like Japan might really be an early adopter. Mm, OK. There's so much overnight delivery in Japan. I see. And uh, even the, the convenience stores in Japan typically have between five and seven deliveries a day. Wow. Because they have no uh, space to store inventory at the local store. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of, you know, there's a lot of opportunities that are a little bit different in different locations. The other thing I should mention is uh, people ask, and one of the early uh, models that I suggested was that there are rotating shuttles which pick up people and drop them at a staging place, and then it starts assembling itself into bigger units, which then transit, uh, let's say, the highway segment, and then it splits up into other modular uh, pieces. So, and the phase one of this I suggested was human-driven, that these are all got drivers you know, uh, at the head of these modules, right? So, so in an earlier lecture, someone asked me, well, uh, what will those other drivers do once this gets assembled and you need only one driver for six modules? What happened to the other five drivers? Two answers to such questions. One is the world is changing and no one has a permanent job. <laughs> the second answer is maybe the passenger is the driver. So out of that set of six times you know, seven modules, 42 people being driven, you have six people who are driving modules. And uh, they get compensated for driving these modules. So essentially, you are picking up a few people and then attaching yourself, and off you go. Make sense? 
Suppose you had one dollar to contribute to this company. How many of you would contribute one dollar? Because you think it's a viable concept. I'm not asking you to contribute anything. <laughs> right? I'm just asking, curious, whether it's, uh, you see it's it as an investable like proposition. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, maybe 100%. <laughs> so, uh, other questions? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to mention there is a company called Parts Enterprises. Uh, you're probably familiar with that. Which one? It's basically a storage uh, place. You know, as a matter of fact, as I, I was just looking up because I, I wanted to rent one, and basically they bring the part to your home and they use it to storage or to move. I see. So they have a service, come and deliver, just like a FedEx kind of thing. Uh, okay. And uh, it's a wonderful service, and uh, yeah. as a matter of fact, I was talking to my daughter last week about renting one of those things. Uh, she okay. sold her house. So uh, that's something you might want to look into. Yeah. When, when you say part, what exactly does it mean? We mean one of these years. Abbreviation for part. No, 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 it, it, we mean a part. <laughs> this one, I we have not thought is, of the uh, you know, TLA for the pod. <laughs> no, I don't know what this stands for, but I think it is portable on demand. Beautiful. Very nice. Go ahead, Bevan. Maybe you can sell to Walmart and the every city's local garbage uh, system. I agree. And you deliver things to Walmart and then you collect the garbage and during the time you don't bump into anybody else. It might be easier to implement. You know, the autonomous world is coming upon us faster than we think. I was in El Camino Hospital the other day, and this little robot is, knows how to dial the elevator button, uh, go to the right floor, and deliver medicine. Another time, I went to the Stanford Mall. Have you seen that robotic policeman? This policeman is this big. It's Huh? He got knocked down. He got knocked down. He got knocked down. He ran into a child. Oh, no. Not, nothing serious, but yeah. Okay, that's a problem. <laughs> but I, do, I have heard that Stanford is planning on a, a test of making the marguerites autonomous. Mm. But they're, they're planning on putting in a couple of autonomous vehicles in the, in the middle of the bus fleet. Really? That's all I know. Wow. But I have heard this. Oh, it would be good to talk to them. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no further questions, we've got some refreshments outside. Uh, I do want to say that this is thanks to the Allen Miner Foundation that we have some refreshments. Please stay and, and let's talk more informally about this idea. Sridhar, thanks so much. Thank you. Great talk. Great pleasure.